Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here today. I can tell you how wonderful it is to be back in Boston. Um, and I want to thank everyone for the amazing welcome. Um, so let's get started. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, people's perceptions of, of algorithms in interfaces that they use that affect their lives every single day. Um, you know, starting from news, um, algorithms affect so much of we encounter online. They choose what we see, hear from the news um, just yesterday. Um, to social media news, um, how many of you have been on Facebook today already? Okay. Not too many. Okay, I thought I was the only anti-social person who studied social computing. Um, but, but also to what we buy. Um, and you can see here, like my, you know, what is being suggested to me is probably influenced by something I bought not for myself. Um, but also to even more expensive things that we buy. Uh, like I'm really curious when I did the search why it thought I should be buying a $10 million house. Um, I don't think I could be buying a $2 million house for that matter. And so you might want to you know, ponder why the order that you get is the order that you get. Um, also, you know, algorithms suggest classes to us. Uh, like I teach a class on data science, but this says I should take one at Michigan. Um, to what we buy, what we wear, um, to who we meet, who we date. Um, and even looking online, um, working on a promotion case, there's a social feed system um, associated with our internal promotion and tenure cases at the university. Uh, so this was a little bit um, bizarre and surreal. More and more, excuse me, we're starting to see consequences of algorithm interactions in the news. So it's really starting to hit closer to home. So for example, um, a simple half-star improvement on a Yelp rating for example, the likelihood of its out, the, the outcome of its rating system can result in a 30 to 49% higher likelihood of selling out seats at a restaurant. Same thing has happened in Fandango with movie theaters. Um, and many people have been caught sort of rounding up as opposed to you know, rounding the way we've been taught in elementary school. Um, you know, more so, uh, Yelp has been the target of nearly 700 Federal Trade Commission reports which accused Yelp of manipulating its review filtering algorithm to force businesses to pay for advertising in exchange for better ratings. Um, you know, we don't know what the process awareness is of these cases. We don't know if they're true or not. All we know is that the FTC is investigating. Uh, to be fair, though, there are reasons for not knowing the process awareness of many of these interfaces. You know, people want to protect their intellectual property. They want to mitigate misuse uh, and gaming of the sites. However, it's causing implications and concern among people. Um, and also, more recently in the news, we're addressing, people are addressing curation up front and center. For example, on YouTube, um, to curb the viewing of conspiracy videos, which are greater in number than non-conspiracy videos on YouTube, um, the company has said, look, we're going to crack down on this. Um, and algorithms have power. I'm not even going to start getting into predictive policing, which is like a whole four-hour talk in itself. Um, but suffice it to say that you are affected by this every single day online. One case in point. Um, Facebook, and this is something we've been studying since 2015 from the advertising perspective, since 2012 from a feed perspective. So this is an interesting case because we're seeing bias on Facebook, not just algorithmically, but also from the interface. Um, meaning that if I want to place an ad, I can target a specific group of people. But these two, um, these two paths towards algorithmic intervention start intermingling and marrying, and what people uh, click on and what people target become indistinguishable after a while inside of some of these algorithms, especially when they're deep learning algorithms. So and again, some systems don't take context into account. So in the context of Facebook advertising, um, you know, ethnic affinity ends up becoming a target variable. And while it's perfectly legal for me to advertise clothing, men's clothing, only to men, it's completely illegal to advertise high-paying jobs exclusively only to men. And so Facebook has been called on this many times, 2016. Um, in 2017, as you can see, they say that they really want to address this, uh, particularly in the areas of housing, employment, and credit, and they're going to do something about this. Because they did not want to help further historical oppression, they were going to put an end to this. Um, this is February of 17. Um, November of 17, however, they were still letting this happen. Um, and again, as I mentioned, at some level, it's an interface issue. But it's, it's at its heart also an algorithm issue in terms of what is housing, credit, and employment. Even those definitions can get muddled. And it's much more complex when these characteristics are inferred from other data, um, which is what's happened actually in advertising over many, many years. And just a few days ago, um, 
they were, again, stopped for this exact same reason. And I can't even begin to tell you how many FTC investigations are going into this. But again, it's a hard problem and something that all of us are affected, of when we go, affected by when we go online. So in this context, I'm going to address algorithms um, in the systems that we use socially from three different perspectives. One, in terms of awareness of curation um, and the importance of awareness. Two, how people behave around an algorithm once they know that it's there. And then again, designing for awareness and control. So awareness, uh, behavior, and then ultimately some design, um, some design paths. So I'm going to start chronologically by a project that we started in 2012 about feed awareness. Um, and this started as myself and some colleagues were sitting around a table trying to figure out why a post was at the very top of our feed for two weeks. Um, and it took some time to figure out. So we brought a bunch of people into the lab, interviewed each of them for approximately three hours. And one of the first things that we discovered was of the people that we brought to the lab, only 37.5% of them were aware that there was an algorithm behind their Facebook news feed. Only you know roughly 38 um, percent. No, this was the one of the first big mistakes. Well, not one of the first big. One of the big mistakes I've made uh, in my studies, in the sense that I assumed that everyone was like me, which is one of the biggest mistakes you can make in HCI. Um, we talked to an award-winning doctor at Harvard, and she's like, "Why would anyone do that? Why would somebody put an algorithm behind the feed? It makes no sense." Um, again, this was done in 2012, 2013. Um, the wonderful Emily Rader you know, replicated parts of our study and found similar results in 2017. So this idea that just with time people know has not come to pass. And you might wonder, why would this happen? Well, one possible reason this could happen is because even if you go to Facebook, um, you have options. You can go to Top Stories, which puts things that it thinks are important for you at the top, versus Most Recent, which is chronologi reverse chronological. But even if you click on More Recent or Most Recent, it's actually an expiring control setting. It actually goes back to top stories whether you want it to or not. And so people who thought they'd said it thought they were seeing things reverse chronologically. Even though the dates were there, they don't realize it. You see similar things with sponsored posts. It's in a lighter, slightly more transparent gray font. People don't realize that they're clicking on sponsored posts. And I'm going to get back to that a little bit later. Um, but of our folks that were unaware, there were some things that were really interesting. They were blaming themselves and making excuses for the system. So for example, this person said, I bet it would be on my newsfeed. I probably would catch it at some point during the day. And I probably don't scroll down enough. But you know, you can't always scroll down so much. You just go like a few posts and that's it. So basically, they were attributing power to the algorithm and taking away some of their own um, power. Of the people that were aware of what was going on, they developed theories or folk theories about how these algorithms worked and use them to plan their behaviors. For example, one Facebook user thought that they should always click the like or comment on their own status points to trigger the Facebook algorithm to start showing their posts in more people's feeds. And so we looked at some of these folk theories. And folk theories are these common conceptions that people come together about a site, whether they're right or wrong. Um, and so in this case, the people that were aware of the algorithm had four common folk theories. One, what we call the personal engagement theory, the global popularity theory, the format theory, and the narcissist theory. And these are our names, by the way. Um, the personal engagement theory, you can guess, the more interactions people have um, on a page, the more likely that is to show. Uh, again, the more interactions you have with somebody, the more their stuff will show up on your page. And somebody says, sometimes when I see someone on my newsfeed who I don't often who I don't often see, I might go and click on their timeline on their specific page so I can see more of their stuff in my feed. So they were coming up with little processes to sort of get what they wanted in their feed because they couldn't find other ways to do that. The global popularity theory, essentially someone said, the more people that click on that story, the more people that comment, the more people get to see it. Like the, um, the ice bucket challenge from a ways back. Narcissist theory. Um, basically, the idea that you see things from people that are like you, having mutual friends, similar interests. In this case, I have the same name as my brother. Um, the format theory was one of my favorites. People argued that Facebook gives different weights to different post formats. Um, however, there was no agreement between which type of format gave you, you know, the most weight. Um, but people th some people thought that it was about uh, images, some people thought it was text, and some people thought it was about movies. And they kept clicking on these things, hoping to see more of them. And so we brought people into the lab to try to better understand. We, we made an intervention. And in this, in this talk, I'm going to show you a bunch of systems that we built for reveals. Um, and so in this first reveal system called FeedViz, what we did is after we figured out if people were aware or not aware of the algorithm, first we showed them this FeedViz interface. And what you're seeing here on your left 
is an interface that shows you in white the posts that did not appear on your feed, um, and in blue, the ones that did appear on your feed. And on the right, again, you see just the ones that appeared in your feed. And the first thing people noticed here was that they only saw roughly 30% of all the posts posted by people in their Facebook network. And for most of the people, they were shocked. They're like, what is going on? We got a lot of expletives. Um, people were angry. The second interface that they saw was this one on the right. So this was a content view. This is a, a people view. And here on the left, you see a column of people where you don't see their posts. In the middle, you see a group of people where you see maybe roughly half of their posts. And on the right, you see a group of people where you see all of their posts. And again, people got a little angry here. And they're like, why is my brother appearing in this left column? He should be on the right. And they're like, why are they hiding so many of these posts from me? Um, and there was a lot of initial surprise. You know, it's kind of intense because you, have you seen the movie The Matrix? It's kind of waking up in a matrix in a way. I mean, you have what you think of your reality and like what they choose to show you. And again, they were coming up with folk theories after seeing these about how the algorithms work. They became empowered. And then we showed them a follow-up interface. We were like, OK, you were really unhappy. You were swearing. Um, what, what did you see that you did not want to see um, in this case? So we showed them what they saw and asked them to click if they didn't want to see it. And of the things that they hadn't seen, we asked them to click if they did want to see it. Um, and similarly with people, we asked them to put people in, in the categories that they wanted them to be in. And it turns out, to their surprise and to ours, content-wise, the, actually the filter was pretty damn good. Um, it filtered out things they didn't want to see. Um, People-wise, it was a little bit different. We're much more, you know, we're social creatures. We care more about people. Um, but for the most part, content-wise, the algorithm did its job. You know, this person said, a lot of what's filtered out are things that don't really pertain to me. I'm so grateful because otherwise it would just clutter up what I really want to see. Um, and so this intervention, this reveal that we showed them, got them thinking more about the algorithm. Um, and people were claiming that it's powerful, and they were calling it a welcome algorithm. And so one of the themes I want to get at this talk, even though it sounds like I'm criticizing these a lot, is that I love algorithms. I think they're important. We just got to get them right. We don't need to hate them or remove them. Um, after the probe, we again investigated people's folk theories. And what we found was that the people that had zero folk theories in the beginning, or rather where their only folk theory was that there is no algorithm, um, it turns out their folk theory started matching, and they got more of them as well. And I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to talk about the top ones. Um, so here we have the control panel theory, the loud and quiet friends, eye of providence, original content, fresh blood, randomness. The control panel theory um, was a big one. You know, you're seeing things because you've set an explicit control. Um, many people in our study had forgotten that they blocked somebody over a year ago, and then they're like, wait a second, maybe that's why I'm not seeing them in my feed. Um, somebody said, I've hidden things like this before, like the daily horoscope and things like that, so maybe that's why these types of things don't show up on my feed. Um, but again, were the theories useful? Um, and this is one of the things that we followed up with people up to six months later to try to see how they changed their Facebook use. After the intervention, 80% of the people were more satisfied with their Facebook usage. They felt more empowered. They felt like because they knew that there was an algorithm there, they could manipulate the manipulation. And they were actually doing these small little hypothesis testing studies in their heads as they played with their feed. And they felt that their feeds were getting better. Um, however, when we asked them, of the theories that you looked at, you know, did you feel they were useful, only two of them were actionable. They could only do things with a personal engagement theory, which is about liking things, whether your own or somebody else's, visiting pages, or the control panel theory. They had many, many theories they could pull from, but they didn't have any levers to actually use those theories. Um, but they felt that even with these two, they could just prod the algorithm along. Um, and again, one of the things that we also found is that because of this, people had, because they were aware of the algorithm, they had more page views on Facebook. So what did we learn from this in terms of awareness? Some people were aware of the algorithm. In terms of processes, they were making, they were making up folk theories. And for those of you who might not be as familiar with folk theories work, um, a lot of that was inspired by the work of Kempton, who studied thermostats back in like the 60s and 70s. And what he did was he got people in their homes, interviewed them, and found that people primarily had two different folk theories about how thermostats worked. One group of people thought that it was more of a switch, that when it got too cold, something clicked on and you know, passed the threshold and the heat started, or more of a valve theory, like a sink, where the more you turn your, the more you turn your valve, the more heat you get. And when you talk to experts, they universally agree that the thermostat works more like a switch. But what Kempton found was that regardless of who had the expert accepted theory, 
there was no better theory in terms of energy use, usage being warm or saving money. What mattered was that you had a theory and you acted on it, and that actually improved your situation. And so one of the things that we're finding some similarities here with Facebook is that just by, and other, other tools, is just by having the theory and being critical of it, that is what's helping you here. We also find that people don't want to know the 700 plus features that affect the algorithm. They really don't care. What they want is a high level overview and they want to see how it fits their lifestyle. With respect to behavior, we found that people were manipulating the manipulation via direct engagement and control settings, and we found increased engagement after the fact, after they knew a little bit more about the algorithm. In terms of control, people were going to the settings, um, they were hiding, they were playing with lists, and there was active engagement. But again, I want to stress that engagement and control were the critical factors here. Um, another example where people tried to create control where it didn't exist is in this um, Next example that I'm giving you, and I'm going to give you a total of five case studies today. And this one is on um, hotel recommender systems. And so, um, how many of you have ever booked a hotel online? How many of you have ever looked at the ratings of the hotel to make your decision? Okay, many of us do that. Um, we might assume that this aggregate view that we see on these hotel rating systems um, is an average, but there are hints this is not the case. For example, you know, Amazon is one of the companies that makes this a bit more explicit. And they say that Amazon calculates the product star ratings using machine learned model instead of raw data average. The machine learned model takes into account factors including the age of a review, the helpfulness votes by customers, and whether the reviews are from verified purchases. So they make it clear that it's not an average. Um, and it makes sense, it makes sense. Why should something from 2004 possibly have the same weight if that product is discontinued as the new version that came out yesterday? Um, but on this one recommender site, some users discovered that even by giving the lowest of scores, for example, they clicked the unhappy face on everything about this hotel. The lowest they could give that hotel was a 2.5. Um, and they were getting angry, and this was reflected in the aggregate reviews. So for example, this hotel had an 8.2, and it may not surprise you that there was almost nothing in the very poor category, given that you can't get below a 2.5. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at here, we did an audit. Um, we do a lot of audits in our group, collected data from about 800 hotels to compare the ratings between three popular, popular hotel rating platforms to see if there were discrepancies. And we found that by the score manipulation, hotel ratings on this one site, particularly low to medium quality hotels, are up to 37% higher than on other hotel rating platforms. And we've seen the implications of this on Yelp, on Fandango. And this is one of the biggest international hotel rating sites in the world. Um, and people were getting really, really angry. Um, and what we did first, this was a, a big complex system, and I'm not going to go into details about the system that we built, but the first part was building almost like a social monitoring system where we observed what people were saying. So we basically used people's comments to infer when bias was happening. If people were saying, this is terrible, this should be a zero. So we had this um, you know, collection of algorithms to find people who thought there was bias. Um, and then we, we actually analyzed their discussion around this, and then we took those and put them into our our comparison platform, um, and then it spit out what was happening. And so, um, I, like I said, we used the search technique first to see if anyone noticed. We found around 162 users became aware of this bias while they were writing their own review as they found a mismatch between the review scores and their stay experience. Many then used the review to raise the bias awareness of other users on the site about this bias through situated actions. So essentially what people were doing is they had no control. They realized that the system was taking away their control. So they decided, I'm not going to write a review the way they want me to. So they reappropriated the system and they were like, ignore what it says. And they were actually structuring their reviews to say, this is crappy, this is good, this is bad. And they were making their own platform on top of the existing platform. Um, but looking like our system that actually tracked what they were saying was finding some really interesting quotes, like overall score does not actually reflect my opinion, disgusting, roaches, uncomfortable beds. I looked at what score your algorithm comes up with, and if I give the lowest grade on all fronts, it still comes out with a 2.5. I was really impressed that people are actually using the word algorithm in their, in their comments. And it turns out it's doable to build little systems just to track people's reactions um, and help you um, figure out what's going on. So what behavior did people, you know, sort of act on because of this? Uh, what behaviors evolved, rather? Um, again, people were appropriating the system. This person said, my rating is adapted, as added up by booking.com of 8.8, .8 is more like a 7 reality. The hotel said deserved a 3, not an 8, which in the algorithm had automatically, which the algorithm had automatically calculated in the back of my responses, and doesn't allow me to amend. I amend other responses accordingly to reach the 3 the hotel deserved. 
So they were actually literally like just making their own site within this site, and it's, it's a thing now. Um, there's also a break in trust. People were just saying, do not trust the customer ratings on this site. I put the lowest rating possible for this hotel, and Booking.com is still giving them a 2.5. I won't use this website again. One thing to note when we did follow up with people, a lot of people threatened to not use sites, but many of them did. Um, for example, we had people threaten to not use Facebook, but it drew them back in. Um, and again, we have no way of knowing who actually left the site and who didn't. Um, but in this case, in terms of awareness, um, very few people knew about the algorithm, um, although some did, as we saw from their quotes. People guessed at the process because it was a pretty dumb process. Of the people who figured it out, they figured it out because there was some process awareness. In terms of behavior, people started publicly educating their audience, started distrusting the system. Um, in terms of control, because you could control your ratings directly, they faked it using what uh, I'm calling impoverished techniques. Um, but they were powerful impoverished techniques. They just didn't have the controls that they wanted. Um, similarly, we started exploring Yelp. And how many, how many people in this room have ever left a Yelp review? OK, not too many. Uh, and it's, you know, I put time into my Yelp reviews. You know, if I go to a place, you know, I, I hope I'm helping people. Um, but the algorithm behind the Yelp system was a bit harder to spot for people. Um, there are many reviews that you see on Yelp, but many people don't realize that the reviews that they write don't get seen, um, which was my case, actually. It turns out I had only written five reviews. Nobody saw my reviews. And one day I was sitting next to my student, and I was showing her like this review that I wrote that I was like, I thought was poetry. Um, and she's like, Carrie, I don't see it. Nobody sees it. And I'm like, what do you mean nobody's seeing my beautiful review? And it turns out Yelp filters out reviews. Um, maybe I'm untrustworthy. Maybe I have not written too many reviews. Maybe my reviews aren't good enough. Maybe by their algorithm, it looks like I'm the proprietor of the place that I'm reviewing. Um, and so I, we realized we weren't the first people to discover this. And we found a forum inside of Yelp where users had conversations about different topics. And many users discussed the algorithm and how it was filtering the reviews. We analyzed over 500 conversations between 2010 and 2017 and did in-depth interviews with 15 people. Um, again, we built another tool. We built another reveal tool. And I have to say, these, these tools are a little hard to build at times. And you, you really care about terms of service and not violating terms of service. But that's another talk for another day. Um, but what we did is we sat people down and had them look at their, looking at their reviews. Um, of the 15 people that we interviewed in depth, um, only three knew that the posts were filtered. And only nine, um, and actually nine had one filtered review that they didn't, know, they didn't know about. They didn't know that people weren't seeing it. And so in terms of behavior, what did people start doing once they realized this? They started writing for the algorithm. And this is something that we've seen in our work over the last six years. This idea of, I would write for the, now that I know what the algorithm is doing, I'm going to be writing for that algorithm as opposed to general audience to get it through so that it might see a general audience. The other thing, again, that people were saying is leaving the system. Because if your review is just going to be grayed out in the, in the bottom and no one's ever going to see it, why are you going to put the total amount of time and effort to it? And so with this group and with another group of people, we were like, OK, let's, let's see what's going on. So we're like, you know, there's an opaque algorithm. Do people believe in opaque algorithms? And then should it exist? There's an opaque process, and then should this exist? And we found that lots of people, you know, in terms of should, some, should an opaque algorithm exist, it was roughly divided into half. Like I mentioned, there are reasons for algorithms like this existing and for them being opaque. Um, for example, there's intellectual property. There's gaming of systems. But universally, everyone thought that you should be aware that there's an algorithm at play. Um, no one thought that it was OK to have a system like this and not let you know that there's some manipulation going on. And so again, in this study, very few people knew of the existence of the algorithm. Um, few guessed at it. And again, the things, some of the things were what I mentioned. People were like, well, you probably need more than five posts. You probably need them to be longer. Um, they probably have some natural language processing algorithm going through there uh, where they say that this is likely a post or not, where they have fake ones and real ones, and so on. Um, control, what did people do? Most people started writing more. When we, when we went up with them later, they're like, I'm just going to write more and more and more posts so that I don't look like I'm somebody who just posted a few. Um, many people had this theory that adding more photos would actually help. So they put photos of themselves in their profile pages. Yes. Um, so sorry. Oh, no. So I have a question um, regarding my own behavior, if you saw that also with other people. So I, I book on booking.coms a lot. And mm -hmm. so um, 
instead of leaving the system or writing the algorithm, I'm sort of, maybe I'm writing an algorithm because I, I do one in my head. I'm just like, mm -hmm. okay, uh, if it's a seven, yeah. that actually means it's below where I want to stay, right? Yeah, so so yeah, I'm yeah. like, I'm playing with the scale and I just, because I realized that booking.com makes at least 20%, right? So it's a huge cut they're getting. So they, yeah. they have this interest in getting as many people booking through their platform f for these hotel rooms. And it's a huge money maker. Yeah. Do, do people realize that, that, that there's all this financial, it's not just an yes. algorithm, it's also that they're, the algorithm's designed yes. for economic reasons? and no, and not everybody. For example, in the Facebook study that we did, the people that are more economically savvy actually are much more in tune with what's happening with the algorithm. So for example, in that study, we actually thought that computer scientists would be like, would know about the algorithm more than anyone. We were wrong. The computer scientists were among the most gullible of people in Facebook. But the people that were really aware of it were the bartenders, the, the hair salon owners, the people that had a business. Because they also had set up pages where they got actually weekly statistics about who went to their pages. So they were much more savvy about the algorithm when they thought about the financial incentives behind it. People who did not think about the financial incentives were not as in tune with what was happening with the algorithms. And so, again, this was something where we thought that, yeah, you know, computer scientists clearly know because they take an algorithms class as undergrads. No, I mean, it's totally different. It's like night and day. Uh, when your livelihood depends on something and when you understand the, you know, the, 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 the machine that basically funds all of this, that helps you get to the algorithm better. And that was a common theme. Yes? How many of the bartenders have used the word algorithm? None of them. So, like, your, your statistic earlier about how many people know there's an uh, your statistic earlier about how many people know there's an algorithm wasn't like 30%? Yeah, but they didn't use that word. Yeah, they, yeah. Use, so, they didn't so use it that would word. would include people who just did, knew there was an algorithm but Yeah, didn't so we got it word. from their discussion. We intentionally, we personally didn't use the word algorithm to not prime anybody. Okay. But, yeah, it's a, like, it was, it was, it was a fascinating study. And people right now are still getting back to us and they're upset because Facebook is changing some of their algorithms to make it harder for businesses online. And so one of the things that's hard about these algorithms that I should state is that they can change every day. They might even be changing every hour. We don't know. And people keep evolving their theories. Um, and so the, one of the things that people realized here in this Yelp case was that, well, maybe my profile isn't fleshed out. So they added photos of themselves. They added more information about themselves to make it more like they were not a bot and more like a human. Um, but notice that most people were using what, what we call, again, in, impoverished controls. Like, there's nothing that says, you know, like, you know, a photo lever. They were making up their own, you know, again, theories about what they can do to, to be viewed and to get credit for all the work that they did. But again, I mentioned the controls on Facebook, how even when you try to take action, it gets reverted sometimes. And, you know, there's several themes popping up here. On Facebook, there are more than five different places on the site where you can actually set controls. They're not all in one place. And especially with the ad controls, they're really, really hard to get to. Um, but we're seeing more and more platforms now, including Twitter, on the upper left, Instagram, and Facebook, that have added control settings to increase user satisfaction and feelings of control, particularly around privacy. Um, but also general feedback a general feedback mechanism to increase user engagement. But it's not clear that people can accomplish their goals using these control settings or even find them. And so we're really interested. I mean, do people use these controls? And if so, um, can we or can they tell if they're even working? And so in this case, people could not tell that even when it was reverted, they could not tell that it was reverted. Um, another thing that we're seeing here on Facebook is, again, more and more of these expiring controls. For example, here, you can snooze. Um, you can stop seeing posts from this person for about 30 days. But then you kind of have to remember that's, that that's happening. I mentioned in our earlier study that uh, people hadn't seen somebody's post and forgotten that they'd forgotten that they had blocked that person. So I'm not saying that these the exp expiring control settings are bad. I'm just saying that it's a new trend and it's growing and growing. Um, and in some cases, the control settings don't even do what they say. So for example, much of the recent controversy relating to Cambridge Analytica and Facebook stemmed from the friends-only privacy control settings, which the FTC claimed in 2011 did not prevent users' information from being shared with third-party applications that their friends used like they said they would. That is, people were using privacy control settings that did not actually do what they claimed to do. But privacy control settings are actually relatively easy to test and validate whether they're working. Um, and again here, we're starting to see a different style of 
a control setting. Privacy ones, yes, you could probably set, but let me take you to a different example of like Photoshop. Let's say there's a control setting where I say, make this image black and white. I can take this and then I can see instantly that the image is black and white. But what if I have a setting that says, see fewer posts like this? What does like this even mean? So now all of a sudden we're getting to this, this era where we're combining sort of machine learning and settings to make machine learning control settings. Um, how do we know that they're working? Um, so a user might know what to expect with a privacy control setting, um, but something that says hide posts like this means clicking it will change the user's newsfeed. But again, we're confounding the algorithm and the control. And when it's difficult for users to validate how and even whether the control settings work, do these controls increase satisfaction because of their operation or because of their mere presence? And so I was like really interested in going back to the control settings literature. And to my dismay, I found out there wasn't much literature to go back to. There's a lot of literature on control when we get to hardware systems, airplanes, things with big knobs and security. Um, and we wanted to see you know, what was happening. Um, but it turns out in existing literature with control settings in the software world, we basically found two books, one by Jeff Raskin where he talks about you know, the humane interface and a section in Lewis and Riemann's TCUID book. Um, most people in HCI treat controls as any other interface. Um, but we're getting into this, this time where we have to really think about how to create controls. Like, do we scatter them into five different six places in one interface? In some cases, it feels almost as if they don't want us to find them. So what did we do? We, des we designed a study to assess, um, to assess how people perceive these controls. So we made our own algorithmic suggestive controls, subjective controls on Twitter. So for example, our controls were sentiment, closeness, um, you know, how close you are to somebody, frequency, popularity, and celebrity. And we wanted to see if there was this illusion of choice or illusion of, of control and illusion of choice here. And so the first thing we did was we went to Mechanical Turk and we made three different interfaces. One interface had um, zero control settings whatsoever. Um, this is the feed with no control. One setting had um, controls that worked to the best of our programming ability. And the other one had the same controls that the middle interface had but we randomized the output. So you could say that you want people that are closer to you, you could say you want people that are further away from you, things that are popular, but it just took from that same set of tweets and just randomized what it gave you. And what did we find? We did this, we replicated this so that each person saw 18 um, screens that they replicated for, um, for consistency. And we found that there's in fact a placebo effect for control settings, that as users were more satisfied with their newsfeed when a control setting was present than when it was not present. But compared to the no control sitting uh, present, even when it functioned randomly, they were roughly equivalent. And so people liked playing with the control settings. Um, again, we don't know if they liked the serendipity of it. We don't know what, but they, they preferred those settings there. On top of that, they were also making excuses about how great the algorithms were, even in the random case. And so we wanted to understand that a little bit better. So again, we brought over 50 people into a lab, um, talked to all of them for over an hour, um, they logged into Twitter and this time uh, they saw a different interface. They saw our control settings on the right and then they saw two different feeds that were controlled by the same settings. And we told them was, look, we have two different algorithms. We want you to compare and contrast the two different algorithms that work. So it was a deception study. Uh, we did not tell them that one was random. We said, explore these and what do you think about the algorithm and which one do you think suits your needs better? Um, again, people were satisfied with both feeds. Um, and we were really concerned. At one point, I was like, wait a second. Maybe what we think of our, our good algorithm, maybe it's so bad, it's no different from random. So in the end of our study, we designed um, you know, a, a check. And we told people, you know, when we have IRB, you do a deception study, you have to debrief people about what you're doing, especially if you're deceiving them. And we're like, look, the purpose of this study was really this. Um, one of these feeds is random. Can you guess which one is random? Um, and 50 out of the 52 people actually guessed the random one correctly. Two did not. Um, so we, we hope that our algorithms are better than random. Um, but it was really fascinating even to see some of the story, like what they were saying. Like some, some person that, um, well, let me, I'll get to that quote. So this person here, for example, they were taking responsibility for the algorithm. So they were seeing sports things. And they're like, well, if you're a sports fan, I'm not really a sports fan. But then if someone saw this picture, they would have known who this is with respect to popularity. 
So they were making excuses for why this is really popular. Um, I'm trying to imagine what the sliders do and thinking of how I've created the conflicting environment. They're blaming themselves, saying that I've created an unstable system. That's why this isn't making sense. But the algorithms are great. Um, it's like, oh, they're still there. I should probably just unfollow them if I don't like them so much. Um, so again, they are attributing power here. And so with respect to you know, awareness, we told them there was an algorithm there. They knew it was there. In terms of process, they were guessing at process. Um, behavior, participants were taking responsibility for the algorithm. And they were reconfiguring their feeds. Um, in control, they were using our subjective social media sliders controls. And so to follow up on this work, we're continuing this. We really want to see if some of the control is just due to serendipity. Like we know that we're attracted to motion. We know we like things changing. We know we like instant feedback. Is that part of the reason we like the randomness? Do we just like seeing the unexpected? Like it could be possible that maybe what we really want is like a, you know, you know, show me something random, you know, slider. And maybe that's part of it. So we still have more work to do to, to disentangle some of what's happening here. Um, and again, is it merely the presence of the controls? This idea that, you know, they're here, and I just am glad they're here if, if I ever need to use them in the future. Um, but people were really attributing power to these algorithms, and we were a bit stuck. You know, in most of these settings, participants used a form of engagement, likes and clicks, or control settings, and the control settings were misleading. Um, and so we were trying to think of like how we might be able to design a little bit better to make people aware of what's going on. And let me just check the time. I'll speed up a bit. And so we wanted to design for engagement. And we started looking at the design literature to date. And we were really intrigued by this concept of seamful design. Um, seamful interfaces allow for comparison. So occasional probes or reveals, like the reveals that I've showed you so far, they're easy for everyday users to understand. And just to give you um, a sense of seamful design, a classic example of seamful design by Matthew Chalmers is like edges and gaps in 802.11 coverage. So for example, you know, at, at its core, seamful design involves deliberately revealing seams to users and taking advantage of features usually considered as negative or problematic and celebrating them. So for example, in 802.11 in this case, this might be an interface used by a sysadmin at the time where you see red as being where you don't have good coverage, green where you have great coverage. But it turns out by showing this to a user, they too started making folk theories, saying, well, look, on the other side of a three-foot concrete wall, concrete wall, I don't get as good coverage as I do, you know, inside. Um, and so, you know, an example of a seamless design, which was what I was taught to design since the 80s um, from the early literature, um, you know, in this case, this is orbits. You put in your origin, you put in your destination, you click, and then it, it gives you a list of, you know, what you want to, you know, possible flights you can use. And so in this interface, um, this might be indicative of a good design. Um, for others, the seamlessness or invisibility indicates that something potentially controversial is at play, as was the case when it was discovered that if you're using a Macintosh, you got more expensive flights on top than if you are not using a Macintosh. Um, and so, you know, it, and this happened long, long time ago, and this is going to keep happening. I mean, this started happening in the 60s when American Airlines partnered with IBM to create the Sabre system, and they went to court. Um, that's another long story, but it turns out that, um, you know, they couldn't figure out why it was wrong to put all of the American Airlines flights at the very top. And they're like, why would we spend all this money on the system if we didn't benefit from it? Um, in contrast, um, some have argued for more visible seams in design. This is an example of the kayak, a rendering of the Kayak website. It pops up all the different windows for different orig original vendors you have to choose from. Um, and it turns out that with the seam fullness, people trust it more because they can see the provenance of the data. And so another interface that we built called WeMetal tries to emphasize these seams in different ways. So for example, in this case, you know, notice we play with typography. We also have the zooming thing here on the left, which is a social zooming feature. If you move that bar to the top, you see more posts from your inner circle. You move it to the bottom, you see more posts from your outer circle. Notice that we did this in 2010. It did not even occur to us at that time to change the order. Um, like it was just out of our, out of our, either we weren't creative enough or we didn't, you know, make money from, from this. Um, but what we did is we, we made things, we highlighted them. We made them in bold, we made bigger fonts. Um, we also had um, control settings where you could see positive tweets, negative tweets, frequent posters, and frequent posters, and your community that we made community clusters on our own. Um, and people really loved this website. We had a huge following in South Korea for reasons that we don't completely understand. Um, huge following in China, which we think is because we got through some censorship issues. Um, but then this had to stop in May of 2012 due to API reasons. Um, 
but we're really interested in how we can communicate algorithmic process to people. And we decided to explore more direct forms of algorithmic awareness and explanation, so we turned to ads. So many of us see many ads a day. People see hundreds of ads a day, it turns out, as of a recent study. But we're really interested in ad explanations, where you click on this little carrot and it tells you why you're seeing this ad. So for example, here, one reason you're seeing this ad is that the New York Times wants to reach people who are part of an audience called US Politics Very Liberal. So how many of you ever clicked on this little carrot to see why you're seeing an ad? OK. Now, as after talking to an ad exchange company, an ad agency, it turns out the number of people that click on these is in the single digits for, of percentages. So not many people click on these. Um, again, we brought many participants into a lab. We had them browse many of their own ads and explanations. Um, of over 30 participants, only one was aware um, that they could actually look at this and see what was happening. So again, we prepared another reveal for them. This one was a more of a low fidelity reveal. So the first thing that we did in this study is we showed people some of their own ads, and we did a speculative design. So it turns out a lot of what I'm excited about in our work, I think some of the best work in our group has been inspired by artists. So I think all computer scientists should work with artists as much as they can and borrow their techniques, like speculative design. Um, and so what we did is we asked them to guess why this ad was tailored to them, and we had them write down their own ad explanations for that. And then what we did is the next stage is we actually took them to the Facebook ad preferences interface and we asked them, you know, why do you think Facebook is, um, thinks that these are your interests? So this is a snapshot from one of my students' pages, because mine was just too boring. I don't use Facebook enough. Um, for example, um, it says that she likes dental floss. Um, now why would, you know, an algorithm think that you like dental floss? I should also mention that of our participants, nobody knew this interface existed, that they could even get to it by clicking on their Facebook control settings. Um, in my case, it claimed that I liked alchemy. And I was really confused, like, why would I like alchemy? Um, and I don't not like alchemy, um, but it just so happened that I was in sabbatical in San Francisco for the year, and we got an apartment that was owned by a company called Alchemy. And I liked the page because I got a discount if I liked the page. And so because of that, um, I liked alchemy, and so things get sort of disentangled, get taken out of context when they get put into systems like this. And then when we told people that this is the data that Facebook uses to advertise to you, they were shocked. They were like, this just sucks. So we just went from empower, algorithms that, empower, that they felt were empowering to algorithm disillusionment when they saw what, would they, what was happening here. On top of that, it turns out most of the things that appeared in the setting happen to be sponsored clicks from Google that people clicked by accident not realizing they were sponsored clicks. So that was something we did not expect at all. Like, people had claimed they'd never clicked on these before, but what happened was they just didn't realize that they were, they were mistakes. So a lot of the ad targeting was happening due to mistaken clicks. Um, also, we were seeing, even though there was some algorithm disillusionment, we still saw some of this attributing power to algorithms. So for example, in the setting, one person saw Whole Foods. Uh, and it claimed that they loved Whole Foods. And the person was like, no, I hate Whole Foods. I don't like that organic shit. Um, and he was saying, but I know why this is here. It's here because I love Amazon. I buy something from Amazon every day, and Amazon just bought Whole Foods. And that's why it's here. And so you know, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic that, was, that we're seeing here. Um, but I was, again, really shocked by how many of things appeared here because of mistaken clicks. Um, and then we actually took it one step further. We asked them to pretend that they were an advertiser. And then they got to see the hundreds of features they could target people on, you know, based on people's income. Um, there was over, there's over 29,000 features you can target somebody on Facebook. And there's even startup companies right now that are a little icky in the sense that they target your wife to get things from your wife if you're, or your partner, and you pay them, and they find them, and they make suggestions via advertisements to your partners. So it's a really weird um, environment that we live in. And we followed, we followed this part up with another um, uh, a speculative design part to complete. So we had a speculative design in the beginning and a speculative design at the end. And we asked them to target people like themselves, and if they got an ad explanation, what would they want to put in it? And what would they want to see in that ad explanation? And we found three big features that they wanted in their explanations to, for them to appreciate the explanation. And this is interpretability, a link to their own identity that they were proud of, and enough transparency. But I want to stress, people don't want too much transparency. They don't want the features. They don't understand how these algorithms work. They want some simple levers you know, to understand some cause and effect. But in terms of inter interpretability, they did not like things that were too vague. 
So for example, here, this ad has been matched to your interests. It was selected for you based on your browsing activity. This person says, to me, this is like the most vague explanation that can possibly be put together so that I won't do anything. They don't really want me to like mess with this. Now, the other person says, it just seems like a black box. Um, something more specific was more amenable to more people. So why am I seeing this ad? One reason you're seeing this ad is that Facebook for developers wants to reach people who have visited their website or used one of their apps. Again, people ages 18 to 54 who live or who live or were recently in the United States. This is information based on your Facebook profile and where you were, you've connected to the internet. The difference is, I guess I'm more comfortable with it because I understand it better. The other ones, I just I don't understand what they're doing. Um, and they wanted more connection to their identity. I should mention that when it got too specific, people felt it was creepy. Um, so identity-wise, um, this person says when they saw this explanation, they were, where personalized, personalization comes from, you know, Google shows you ads based on many factors, including these. This person is like, it's not personal at all. They take an impersonal approach to explaining something like a personal ad, which is kind of contradictory to me. Um, in contrast, um, this person said, um, you know, it's kind of going an extra mile. I think I do like that because I like to see how I'm categorized, where they say that this person is very liberal, 18 and older. Um, and again, this data is exactly from that interface where I showed you of people's interests, where they infer things about you based on what you click. Um, but then, um, I should say that they liked this when it aligned with the image they had of themselves. So if anyone is familiar with Goffman and this concept of, you know, what is given and given off, um, some people were upset with inferences made that they didn't feel aligned with their own perceptions of themselves. So with a very liberal case, the person was like, nice, glad it knows that, and they laughed. With a person that was um, not listed as a late technology adopter, they were angry. Like, I don't know what the hell is all about. We have all the newest crap. Every time the new phone comes out, we get them. We have all the video game systems, the smart TV, the Roku, the Wii. Um, and it was really upset that they were not categorized, not labeled as, a, as, a, as, a, as an early technology adopter, but rather as a late technology adopter. Um, and so when we brought them you know, to the interface to actually choose the specific design that they wanted, um, they were very selective about what they chose. Like people liked young and hip, you know, electronic music. So when we asked you know, them to write their own explanations, it's like, seems like you are young, hip, and enjoy electronic music and video games. They don't think they want one things that are exhaustive. They think it would be around finding or saying the categories that are more cultural rather than specific. And so this is kind of interesting because it turns out that of the ad places that have the power to show you these ad explanations, Facebook is the one that has the most personalized data about you. You know, then Google, but then every place else most has event data, like what you clicked on. And so Facebook can provide this information, whereas other companies can't really to that degree. And so they're at a huge, huge advantage. Um, and so how should we communicate to people when we do this? Um, People are like, I've never clicked on those before. I wonder if people ever do that. And like I mentioned earlier, the, number, the, the percentage of people that do that is in the single digits. Um, and then this person said, I just don't trust them enough to even do anything via these ad choices. Um, and so going into the design world, um, people were advocating designers themselves about the explanation becoming part of the ad. So for example, in this case, you've shown interest in Umer. Maybe that's not enough, but people like the idea of not having to click on that. We know that every time you have to click on something, you lose you know, a good percentage of your audience. And so the idea was that rather than you having to go out of your way to search, why don't you just tell you directly in the ad itself? And this idea of a new style of advertising where the ad itself becomes part of the explanation. So this person suggested, you know, as an active person who loves music, you should be able to bring the speaker wherever you go. Um, and, you know, they weren't the first to discover this. You know, this has been happening to some degree. You know, this, this real ad says the internet's told us you were looking for the best online appointment scheduler. So it's already starting to happen. Um, so we did see cases of disillusionment, like I mentioned before. Um, and we also saw unexpected and pleasant surprise um, that attributed power to the algorithm. And we also saw false power to an algorithm not being as... Um, not, not being as um, terrible as we expected, although that has other implications that need to be teased out. Um, but I want to end this talk by saying that we need to do a much better job designing some of these algorithmic explanation interfaces for people um, and design them in a way that makes sense to them, uh, that are authentic to them. 
Um, but also I want to stress that we have to be careful of the deception that can happen because we know what people want. We have to be careful not to give them just what they want but what can be helpful. So our future work includes te teasing this apart from two different uh, perspectives. One, seeing what gives people clicks and not just going for that, but two, also looking at what improves and increases people's literacy. So in conclusion, um, people should not be scared of algorithms. They should instead design for algorithm awareness, embed signals and interfaces that help people see what's going on and make it easier for people to create these mental models, these folk theories, include intermittent reveals that allow for comparison. And I'm not saying that people need to see these reveals 24 seven all the time, but maybe every month you could have one of these reveals where people can choose to explore the sandbox. I would love it if there was like a Facebook glitch day uh, where maybe once a month they left a printf statement in the feed to give you a sense of what might be going on. Um, we want controls that are easier to find and a better explanation of subjective controls because anything goes there right now. Um, again, just help people make sense and appropriate interfaces for their own use. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so I have a question about filter bubbles. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have any research that addresses this or any suggestions on how to try to tackle that problem. So we've done some research in the, fil in the filter bubble domain with um, blogs a few years ago. Um, and we found that the genre mattered a lot. So for example, we did not find too much of a filter bubble effect in technology forums but we found a huge filter bubble effect in political forums. And so the first thing, you know, if I were to continue that work, would be to look at you know, separating these different genres of what's happening. Um, since we've done that work, there's been a lot of work actually you know, being very critical of whether or not there even are filter bubbles. Um, one of the things that we're finding with algorithms and algorithm awareness, though, is that just by letting people know that there's an algorithm there, they can start being critical of the content that they see. And so my personal you know, view, and again, it's probably because of the path of research that we've taken, is to make it clear to people why they're seeing what they're seeing. And to some degree, I think to some degree, the, this idea of, of a filter bubble is unavoidable. Um, and also, in some more recent work that we've done, where we tried to show people things that they don't want to see, we make them angrier. And so if I were to you know, start a new project on this tomorrow, I would think about a system that maybe just slowly you know, showed people something that was slightly, diff slightly different, but not something that was too drastically different. And there's a project that I love done by the brilliant Eric Gilbert. Um, I think it was called Political Blend. I don't know if you saw it. But because we know that you know, the politics are, it's a really hard space uh, for people of opposing opinions. And what he and his students did were they, um, they gave people an interview to find out where their, where their political leanings were on a spectrum. And then what they did is they wanted them to talk to each other. And so they, they worked with a local cafe and they printed out two halves of a coupon. And one person got one half on their phone, the other person got the other half on their phone. And if they met at that cafe, they could put these coupons together and that cafe would give them each like a, a huge discount and a cup of coffee and they would just sit down and talk. And what they found was that if their political ideologies were different but not too different, they could have a pleasant conversation. If their ideologies were too different, then they could not. Um, and we're, we've found consistent, you know, we're, have, we fa have findings consistent to his in the context of people's, you know, filter butt bulbs in the LGBTIQ context um, and crowdfunding. And so we find that in the LGBTIQ setting, for example, like whether or not you should, you know, provide funds for, you know, a lesbian wedding, it turns out people that are very open-minded and, and tend to be more liberal, you know, say, yes, we should do this. When they see an opposing view, um, about why somebody would not want to do this. They're like, well, I can also see their point of view. Um, so we found that they became less polarized in their views, but we found people that, are, that were more, higher on the neurotic scale, lower on the open-mindedness scale, it tended to be a bit more conservative. Um, they became more polarized and not funding a lesbian wedding and became um, even more polarized against. Um, and so we, we're finding that different groups of people behave differently with different types of information. And so I think, it's time to stop talking about the filter bubble as just this one concept, but to look at the specific context, content setting, but also the groups of people. Um, and I'm, I'm scared, I hate what I'm going to say next and the personalities of the people. And that the reason I hate that I said that is because advertising companies are doing 
personality assessments on us all the time. And if we're high in openness and low neuroticism, they're going to show us even more ads that might be different from what, it turns out we're more amenable to different types of ads. And so, but the fact of the matter is personality does matter. And people know this and they're targeting us based on that right now. Yes, yes. The big five, sorry. So the personality, do they measure it with big five? Most so, people, yeah. There's lots of, but the predominantly the big five. All right, thank you. Yeah. Great answer, thanks. Yes. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, so before your presentation, we talked outside, and there was this brief discussion of sheep and UUNet, and I'll come back to that. But so there are people who probably who study sheep, and sheep, you know, they existed for a while, and they will outlive us. And so they're natural kind of occurring creatures. But then a lot of things you've discussed, like Facebook and Google, and the way data is collected about us is, you know, it's created by humans. And so in your talk, there was this discussion of us and the algorithm, but maybe not as much, perhaps because you were limited in time, about the society where it comes in and says, we don't want some of those things. Mm -hmm. And that could be a very strong influence that would may sweep away some of the things or make them more complicated or simpler. And if you have any thoughts on that. So can you elaborate a bit? Um, yes, yeah, so we could say the data has to be revealed. You know, what is being, mm -hmm. uh, how, so manipulation of reviews has to be made public. You, if you don't want to read 20 pages that explain it, yeah, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. but companies cannot hide behind uh, proprietary technology yeah. to hide it. Or Facebook, I believe there was a law passed that protected them against being responsible for what's posted on their content yeah. on their website. But society could say, well, we want to tweak the dial a little bit. And then that would change a lot of things, may make some people, uh, the owners of those companies, a little bit poorer. Yeah. But then it would change also the algorithms, the settings, because all of a sudden, yeah. uh, this other part, the society will come in and say, you can't do certain things. Yeah. So I mean, there's so many different variables. Uh, that's an excellent question. There's so many variables here from sort of like the you know, evolution of human communication on one side to policy, lobbyists, laws, and advertising revenue on the other side, and probably lots in between. Um, from the Facebook point of view, like I think it would be fascinating, and I'm sure some people are doing this, if people stop to consider like what a different type of business model would look like if it wasn't all about you know buying our attention. Um, you know, alternative view for this might be since they are vying for our attention, why shouldn't I get some money every time somebody uses my data? And so there's those. Those are just two of the many approaches people are looking at from that angle right now. From the other angle, one of the things that I think about a lot are, you know, often it takes generations to change how we think about things. And like you said, this is happening so quickly. I mean, when I was a freshman, um, I would think I was really popular if I got five emails a day. And now I really want to get five emails a day and that's it. Um, and so even my perceptions of that have changed. And so I would argue that we need to do a lot of thinking about whether or not, you know, even some of these folk theories, like how much they're helping us and how much is it more, at, there's this micro scale of behavior and interpretation that we have and this macro scale that's happening generation from generation. Um, I think that a lot of what's happening, it's, it's interesting to tease apart what's happening in the US and Europe with respect to policy. So policy clearly plays a role here. Um, and there's many things in Europe like GDPR that don't exist here, but I have to kind of bleed in because these companies are international companies. And so policy clearly plays a role because, because if you want something to happen in the EU, EU you have to abide by that policy. Um, and GDPR is an interesting example. Um, and GDPR is also, for, for those of you who don't know it, at a very high level, um, one, of the, one of the parts of GDPR is that if it, an algorithm makes a decision on your behalf, you have to understand why it made that decision. So a lot of people care about explainability in Europe for that reason. Um, but that has some pros and cons. So for example, to, to satisfy that, I've seen some people take like deep neural nets and take a localized section of data and do linear regression on that to explain that. But then do you really, what if that's not an accurate explanation? Is it better to have a good, a, a good reliable explanation or no explanation at all? There's also loopholes to this in the sense that if you have human intervention that you don't have to provide an explanation. Um, Policy plays a, a huge role, um, and I think society plays a role in backlash in society. And so right now, it really is almost like the Wild West when it comes to what's happening. And even when we've seen how, we, we've seen our data misused, we've seen control settings that say they do one thing and do something else. 
We've also seen people not mind that, um, which is disturbing. And so I think that right now there's a lot of, I'm, I, th I personally think there's a lot of power from lobbyists um, that are emphasizing revenue. And I would really, really love to see people just think a little bit outside the box about different types of models, even if knowing that we live in a capitalist society, it's unlikely they'll happen in the near future. But I think we need to have a discussion about what a company could look like if it wasn't run by ads. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is really important work. Um, I, I was gonna actually ask you about uh, regulation and you already uh, started talking about that. So when I drove to work this morning, um, they were talking about Great Britain and uh, that they're gonna try to uh, restrict YouTube and make sure that they do more filtering. And so I'm wondering how would you envision uh, regulation to kind of work so that um, things can be more revealed to us, and it's, it's such a hard question. Yeah, well, I, you know, if you look at, um, you know, the Humane Society book that I talked about, he argues that a lot of the controls should be just on one level zero and not beneath. So with respect to explanation, I believe that, A, not everyone wants explanation. I think it's a mistake to, th to assume that everybody wants it. But I think for the people that do want it, I think you should provide different scales of explanation. Um, uh, a related study, not by us, but by somebody else, looked at classroom and how they revealed people's, the, the algorithm for how grades were generated. And so they put people into three different categories. One where they just said like roughly, you know, this and that and that make up your grade. At the other extreme, they got like the exact formula for what made up their grade. And the, they got something in the middle where it was like, you know, roughly this percentage of that, this percentage of that, this percentage of that. People hated the extreme, like the too much specificity, which matched our work in ads. They found that creepy. They hated the too, the, what was too vague. But they liked something in the middle. And my theory is that the reason they liked something in the middle is because it also provides them with some plausible deniability where they can blame somebody else or an algorithm and not themselves. And psychologically, we need that to a degree. Um, just like people wanted to feel like they were not late adopters, but early adopters. Um, and so I think that we need different levels of granularity for what people want. So for example, you might go in and you might want to see the entire formula. But I'm quietly confident that the general population would probably not want to go that far. Um, but I do, I would love to see regulation that A, allowed for independent auditors. So this leads to another body of work that I didn't talk about today. But for example, in housing and in employment and in loans, um, in housing specifically, the HUD actually, the law says that you have to have a third party auditor go in and make sure that realtors are not discriminating against people based on race, gender, ethnicity, familial status, um, and disability. Um, and so, you know, what they do is they take, they take um, families and they try to match them, give them similar like cars, you know, same income, but then one family might be black, one might be white, they send them to realtor and see what, what happens. Um, and then they, re they report this. And the last report I saw was from 2012. We've been trying to do something similar with housing online. Um, and we are finding some discrimination happening online with respect to some of these housing websites and ads and in what people are shown. Um, but we've also encountered some work, some, some problems um, with respect to terms of service. And so we ended up suing the US government with colleagues in Northeastern next door and Michigan and a media company to be able to do these independent audits. And I really believe that on top of ac explanations, I think we do need audits by people who are not affiliated with the organizations. Because, you know, for a long time, we've let a lot of these organizations regulate themselves. Um, and it's hard. Some people aren't capable of doing it. Some people also do want to pass the buck to somebody else and say, look, just tell me what you do and, and I'll do it. Um, going back to ethics, you know, a typical thing I see in a computer science department is a developer comes up to me and says, Carrie, you know, just please give me a list of rules so that if I follow every single one of these rules, I'm ethical and I don't have to worry. Um, and it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, and even the term ethics is a contestable term. There isn't like a, I would, you would find 10,000 people with 10,000 different definitions for what ethics means. Um, but what, what I, going back to your original question, um, I think that we need third-party independent auditors um, to a lot of these systems. Because when we do leave it to the system itself, you can see you know, how
things run amok. I'm also curious, from a computer science perspective, even in designing large systems like this, you know, when I was an undergraduate, you know, we took these classes about building large programs, and, you know, we were our own chief architects. I'm really curious to what degree a chief architect at a big social media company, like, do they even, like, understand the architecture of the systems that they work with today? Um, because it's, it's an entirely different beast than, you know, working with decision trees or finite state machines and so on from, like, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so I, I would... I think we need to start having computer science courses where we start thinking about what it means to be, you know, a CTO or a chief architect of a large, complex machine learning system to understand where it's going. And I think we need to start thinking about these systems as having small audits built inside of them to actually, you know, in interrogate and audit modules one step at a time. So imagine, let's say you had a microfinancing company um, and it had like 100 different modules inside of it you know, might you be discriminating against, you know, minorities or women early on? Um, but I think we need a new style of CS where we focus on audits. Um, and once we teach people to do that, I also think we need to do, um, you know, third-party audits. And at the same time, how do you do this in a way without stealing intellectual property? So maybe, you know, you invented a whole new field of computer science, but it's something that needs to happen. Um, and I'm really getting excited today about some of the differential privacy work that's happening. Um, and I think maybe we can borrow some of what's happening in that field to better understand what's happening here. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk again. Uh, I wanted to ask about your personal opinion if we have on the scale and one side we have algorithms where people can tweak everything and put them in a bubble like Nathaniel said and like completely form what they know and yeah isolate themselves from reality or um, the society and on the other side of the scale we have algorithms that try to uh, make people better according to their own definition of what it means to make people better where should research and companies be on this scale and uh, yeah, how, a... like, do, do people who build those systems have even the, it's, it's a huge responsibility to, like, shape real people. Yeah, I think that's a great question and I wish I had a black and white answer for you, but I don't and I'm hoping I can come back and see you give a talk about that one day. Um, but what I can say is that people want different things at different times of the day. So on like a lazy Sunday morning, I, mo I might want to read something about entertainment that's more mindless just to clear my head. Um, and then on a Monday morning, I might want to read about, you know, the latest and greatest that's happened in my research field. So I think the first thing we have to address is that people don't always want the same thing all the time, and that's okay. Um, and then after that, I think we do have an, an ethical, a moral, and a legal obligation to address misinformation. So I think that this idea of, you know, providing, providing information as true when it's not, um, I think we need, to, we need to seriously address that and, and do something about it. Now, how to do that, there's like hundreds of people looking at that right now, and we don't have a clear sense of how to best do that. Um, traditionally to date, the way that's worked has been almost like a trust network. Like, let's say that Magritte is the expert on neural networks, and I'm not. I might, you know, look to her opinion on that. Um, similarly with climate change. Like, to be honest, I have not looked at all the data on climate change. Um, but because I've looked at comments and papers from people I trust, um, I, I tend to believe that it is happening. Um, and so I think we do have a moral obligation to address you know, false information prevent, presented as true information. But I think it's also interesting to look back through history and see that we've always had false information. Like, it's not a new thing. And so I think addressing it, like, thinking of it as a new thing is not, I mean, even Benjamin Franklin, you know, participated in, like, huge misinformation campaigns. Um, and so I think there's something really interesting about approaches where you trust people and who you trust. Um, and people tend to trust their parents. Um, and people tend to have the same political beliefs as their parents. Um, and so I think that's, that's one area that we should look at. But I think that we're not looking, I think we're looking at all the obvious things, myself included, and we're not looking at some other approaches that we might look at from more convoluted methods. Um, 
But I also think that there's, there's a reason people like to read some of these things, and we have to acknowledge that as, as well. Um, and I also don't feel like I am like the queen of what people should, should look at online. Um, you know, I look at, I, I'm really interested now in looking at how little kids interpret algorithms and how you put a kid in front of YouTube and within minutes they're looking at people unwrapping toys. Um, and I personally would argue like I, I don't like this, but it seems like people are really attracted to this and I, I really want to understand why before I say that it's bad. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. No, I know that you're in millions just unwrapping toys. And I really want to understand what the fascination is. And I, I feel almost guilty saying it's just bad, even though that, that's what my gut says, without understanding how and why it's happening. And so I think that we're still like in the early baby steps of, of what we need to see. And some, sometimes I, I feel like I read something mindless just because my brain needs to shut down. And you know, maybe, in, maybe your body sometimes knows what it needs better than some person up and above that says, this is what you should be doing right now. Yeah. That's fascinating. How old are these kids who are saying this? this six. six. Yeah. Wow. But now seven. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's facts like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's also just so interesting. I mean, like even all of us growing up probably have some memory of our parents telling us not to do something because it's bad, and it turned out to be helpful for us. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to be as open-minded as I can, um, even while you know watching people unwrapping gifts. <laughs> They're millionaires, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a fascinating world that we live in. How would you even yeah. approach the question of whether kids should or should not watch the videos of other kids? That is a great, great question. You know, just going back to that, there's a study that came out just a few days ago about like screen time for teenagers, and like you see something happening all the time. Um, you know, addressing this, and so like a few decades ago, somebody did a study that said the internet causes depression. Um, and then they followed up that work 20 years later saying, wait, we were wrong. Um, we find you have to tease it apart. And it turns out that if you produce content online, it's less likely to cause depression. But if you only consume, then it causes depression. And so look, it took like 20 years to make this distinction between the internet causes depression to what you do on the internet and how you consume or produce plays a role in how it affects your mental health. And so I think it's going to, again, we're not going to solve this next year, but I think we have to start teasing apart what kids watch, like classify that, um, what they do. You know, do they, um, you know, do they consume? Do they produce? Do they leave comments? Um, and then once we have these categories, look at some some metrics about you know quality of life, well-being. Um, but again, these studies take a really, really long time. Um, and the other thing that you know was fascinating about watching you know, some of these kids work on these projects, like talking to kids today, like when I was, when I was young and you ask kids what they wanted to be when they grow up, they were like, oh, I want to be a doctor, a policeman, a fireman. Like you talk to kids today and they're like, I want to be a YouTube star. And yeah, and so I mean, it's very likely that the professions these kids will have don't exist today. And so like, I think we have to like really just like think about what our infrastructures are like turning into. I mean, even education today, you know, online with Coursera is very different from what I expected when I was in high school. Um, and there's going to be many paths open to people, and I want to encourage people to be creative in their career choices. Um, and I, I have to say that for someone who studies social computing, I am pretty antisocial uh, online. So I think one of the reasons I don't understand a lot of the YouTube phenomenon is because I'm not actively engaged in it. The one thing that I, what was, it really intrigues me though is how people game the algorithms on YouTube. So for a while there was this group called the Reply Girls and because they really wanted to make money on YouTube, they would take these videos that had lots and lots of views and they would post comments in them with 
suggestive content, su suggestive content um, you know, with scantily, people with scantily dressed in the images. Um, and it turns out that by having their responses to already heavily viewed content, they were generating thousands of dollars by piggy piggybacking off of other people. So that, like, they gamed the algorithm beautifully, and the algorithm let them do that, and they, re they reverse engineered and figured out that they could do that. And it turned out, going back to your question and to your question a little bit, because of the huge public outroar, then they stopped it. So, you know, people can affect a system through, you know, a massive voice. Um, because people were people were getting really really upset, and they they saw it as a as a as a hole in their system. All right, everyone.